Thank you very much, Narsana. Um, thank you to the amazing team of volunteers that has worked with you. Um, yet another proof that when people join together, they're a wonderful substitute for capital. Uh, usually we are made to feel very uh, poor for lack of capital, not realizing that at the end of the day, things work when people cooperate. And we tell it's such a joy to be with you again. Um, I remember, I think it must have been around 89, 88 maybe, I'd been invited to give the Schumacher lecture. The Schumacher College had not yet started, but Bill Mollison and I were the two speakers. Now, I wasn't supposed to be doing agriculture, but the Bhopal tragedy, and I've been told your group of friends really came out of the Bhopal tragedy. Uh, I threw myself into the uh, deeper work on agriculture with the Bhopal tragedy and the rise of violence in Punjab. And Punjab is a very good example of how you can totally ruin a prosperous society, rich ecosystems with the wrong model of farming. Today Punjab soils are dead, the rivers are dying, the water's disappearing. Farmers have cancer, they travel in a cancer train to uh, Bikaner, and as they, sem they sem say to us, and our soils have cancer. I remember once when the first early suicide started, I was taken to a village and everyone who was moving was carrying sprays. One had a very big tank, one had sprays on bicycle, and I asked them, I said, you know what you're carrying? They said, yes, medicine, dawai. I said, no, it's poisoned, and I read out. They said, but we don't read English. And then the old man said, oh, now I understand why our mango trees are not fruiting anymore, because the pollinators were gone. And the young man who was taking it in a cycle said, oh, this is why I get so dizzy after I spray, and I must lie down for two, three hours when I get home. They've been so misled into thinking these poisons are medicines. And now 75% of the youth of Punjab are on drugs because everything is so hopeless. The next election of Punjab will be fought on these issues. So here was Bill who had promoted, inspired the permaculture movement and he gave his lecture on the financial crisis. And here was me who done a background in quantum theory, done my work in Chipko and I was talking agriculture. So when the question started, Bill's uh, follower said, but we came to hear about permaculture. And he said, if you don't sort out the large context of the economy, there will be no permaculture. And that's the whole issue, that when we talk permaculture, we are not talking about techniques. And I'm so glad, as you mentioned, that every group that works on the permanence of agriculture is permaculture. It could have different names but it's the practice and the principles that really matter. And the two permanence principles we need to seek are the permanence of nature. You've put it there as earth care, dharti sanrakshan, and people care, jan sanrakshan. And people care can't take place without fairness and justice. And that really is the problem of the current crisis of agriculture. The first problem is that we have been made to forget that Indian civilization is based on the principles of permaculture. First, in North India we say, first Krishi, you know, then trade, and the worst is a nokri to be a serf to someone else. And now, of course, it's the opposite. The fanciest thing you can do is be a slave to a multinational. That's what all our young people are being groomed for. 
And then, of course, after 10 years, they get bored or they have burnout. And then they come to us for training. And how do I become an organic farmer? So I always say, after the high tech job, is back to the land. So you might as well protect the farmers who are on the land and invite others who want to become farmers. And we have to work on making good care of the earth as the highest vocation of humanity. So we had a break with our long uh, traditions of permanence, um, with the Green Revolution. But we were very lucky that when the British wanted to improve our agriculture with chemicals, they sent a man called Albert Howard. And he and his wife found the soils were fertile, there were no pests in the field. He'd been sent to set up what became the Pusa Institute, I, eventually IACR. And as he writes in his book, Agricultural Testament, I threw away the spray gun, and I remember just like you printed Bill Mollison's Permaculture Principles, Claude and our research foundation brought back Albert Howard's Agricultural Testament, which is about the principles of permanence. And he writes very clearly, agriculture in the Orient, in India, is as permanent as the forest, as the prairie, as the ocean, because it follows the principles of nature's permanence. And nature's principles of permanence are two. One, Diversity. Nature never works as a monoculture. Never, nature never creates uniformity. It constantly creates diversity. And our farming has amplified diversity. When I started Navdanya, I turned to Dr. Risharia to help us. Dr. Risharia is the person who documented rice varieties of this country. In his assessment, 200,000 varieties. Semi-arid tracts, beautiful seeds outside, the ragi, the juari, how much diversity. Even the tur. We are a land of diversity. We are a land of biological diversity and of cultural diversity, which is also being threatened by various other forces. And the other principle he identified was the law of return. That nat in nature, no one species keep taking from other species. I call that the extractive economy. Sadly, that extractive economy is what GDP measures. How much can you extract from nature? How much can you cut, cut down forests? How much can you dam rivers? How, can, how much can you steal tanks? I mean, the Chennai floods were related to the stealing of the place for water. A lot of the new Hyderabad development is about stealing from water. And uh, we've seen the consequences with the Chennai floods. But stealing has become the basis of the model of economy that is called growth. Because all it does is take from the peasants and it takes from the land. Doesn't give back. The law of return is vital for an economy of permanence. If we don't give back organic matter to the soil, the soils will be impoverished. If we don't close the cycle of water and hydrology, we will have desertification and drought. If we don't give back to the farmers their fair share, the last slogan up there, the fair share, we don't go back to the farmers their fair share, we will have debt, we will have suicides, we will have destitution of a very, very high level. And I do believe India is in a deep emergency. It's in a deep emergency with take just two symptoms. How could we not only continue to ignore the fact that 300,000 farmers have committed suicide because of this economy of extraction, but we actually have an entire machinery that then says it's because of mental illness 
and the same government that can't find the will to ensure farmers get a, a proper price suddenly will find the will to put psychiatrists in every village. And you can decide whether insanity lies. The second indicator of our crisis is the fact that every fourth India, Indian is hungry. Every second child is severely malnourished, stunted, wasted. And we've become an epidemic of cancer. We've become the epicenter of diabetes. You add up all the diseases related to food. We are a very sick society. And we'll get sicker as the trends carry on if we don't change those trends. Now, there's a very big understand, misunderstanding of equating permanence with stagnation. And I think that comes out of a mechanistic idea of how the world works. Comes out of that 200 years of the reign of reductionist mechanistic science. Because in mechanistic science, if something is not changing place, it is inert and dead. But a plant doesn't have to change its place to grow well. The soil doesn't have to get eroded and move into the seas and the oceans as soil erosion. Staying in place as a healthy being, whether it be a healthy plant or healthy soils or healthy human beings, is a symptom of hugely dynamic evolution in homeostasis. So, you know, I, I did my basic work in quantum theory, and you have a nucleus, you have the electron going round. The electron goes round, it's moving all the time, it's not static, but it is staying within the so-called stationary state. Without it, it would be an unstable system. So the issue of permanence has to be counterposed with the issue of disintegration instability, degeneration. And our challenge is to turn this around into sustainability of nature and her ecosystems and sustainability of societies. As far as the permanence of nature's economy is concerned and earth care is concerned, we really have two jobs. And interestingly, our first agriculture minister after independence who was a close friend of my parents, and therefore I have all his books in my parents' library. K. M. Munshi said, we have only two tasks. The wars and colonialism disrupted our nutrient cycle and our hydrological cycle. All we have to do is fix the nutrient cycle, which is return to the soil, and we have to fix the hydrological cycle, conserve water. And in that period, IAS officers, and we have two, senior representatives from that community. The training for IAS, the first training used to be how to make a compost pit and how to dig a water harvesting tank. That was civic administration. That is what administrators were taught and that's what farmers were taught and they were absolutely equal in earth care and people care. The disruption of Nature's economy began with, you know, fortunately, Albert Howard blocked it at that time. But after independence, the interests who were trying to look to introduce leftovers of chemical warfare from the Second World War started to try and push these agrochemicals under the name of the Green Revolution and green revolution development. And of course, they had to make a spin. They had to talk about having higher yields. They had to talk about productivity. So the nitrogen fertilizers came out of the explosive factories, which is why you still get nitrogen bombs being made. I remember the bombings in Hyderabad were nitrogen bombs in the jewelry market. The same was the High Court. The same is Afghanistan. Same is Oklahoma. Same is Oslo. Nitrogen bombs is where it goes back to. And the synthetic pesticides, the first early 
poisons were designed, both for poison gases for the war as well as gases for the concentration camps and the gas chambers. So pesticides, herbicides, fertilizers all have their roots in war. And they've carried on that war, which I, I always said that Bhopal was not an accident. These chemicals are designed to kill. In Bhopal, they killed in a concentrated and instant way. But they're killing every day. They're killing every day. The farmers who are spraying them. And my heart breaks when I travel to Vidharba or I travel to Punjab where the only thing you see, be, see being done in a field is the spraying of poisons. And now the Chinese are selling us these big ones. You know, earlier you had one nozzle, and now one man can go around with eight and 10 nozzles and spray even more vigorously. And it's called efficiency. But it's only efficiency to kill. What did nitrogen fertilizers do? First, they kill the life of the soil. 90% are washed away. They're killing our water systems. They're creating dead zones. A large part escapes as nitrogen oxide, 300 times more deadly than carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas. 50% of climate change is coming from the chemical industrial model of farming and the globalized trade in food. 50% of the problem. And in the permaculture lies a 100% solution because you can take out the excess carbon in the air which, where it doesn't belong and put it in the soil where it does belong, making the soil more fertile. The law of return and its violation has broken what are called planetary boundaries and created all the buildup of toxics, both in our soils and in our bodies. And we have the alternatives this year is the year of pulses. You know, suddenly the UN is waking up to appropriate themes. Last year, they declared it to be the year of soil and the whole world woke up to the fact that there are soils and the soils have life. And I remember producing for uh, one of the big UN gatherings um, a manifesto on soil and we cited from the Vedas 4,000 years ago that in this handful of soil lies your future. Take care of it, it'll take care of you. Destroy it and you will be destroyed. And every civilization that has been wiped out has been wiped out with the destruction of soil. The fact that we've lasted so long is because we took care of the soil in the worst of situations. And we could be wiped out as a civilization if we forget thousands of years of learning about where does agriculture come from? Where is society resting? Pulses fix nitrogen in a non-violent way. They're guardians. When you make synthetic fertilizers, you have to take fossil fuels, blast them at 550 degrees centigrade, do violence all the way, including in the use of the fertilizer. You have a dear Sultan with you who will share in depth the kind of violence these chemicals do to the earthworm and to the other organisms in the soil. So let us make this year of pulses the year to reclaim Indian agriculture in which pulses were central, both for care for the soil through nitrogen fixing and care for our health. We are the only civilization in the world whose protein base is pulse-centered. Those who eat meat eat a little extra meat, but they still eat pulses also. A meat-eating person from Telangana will not stop his sambar, won't shift to big chunks of meat. The sambar is still important. And one of our big campaigns that we are going to launch, I'm just finishing a new book on pulses called The Pulse of Life. Part of it was to rejuvenate our pulses because that's what we've been doing in Navdanya. We've been conserving our seeds and it's been such an amazing discovery of a journey, you know, the Gehet and the uh, uh, Norangi. So when I started collections in 87, I would take 
books from my parents' library with images and tell the villagers, do you have this, do you have this, do you have this? The English name of every pulse is an animal feed name because the British were meat eaters. They didn't know what to do with pulses. So they made chana, chickpea, tur, pigeon pea, gehet, horse gram, avre, cow pea, only animal feed. So the first level at which we forgot was that. Second level at which we forgot was green revolution based on so, uh, um, only rice and wheat, and the pulses were driven out. And so today it's not an accident that we have a pulse crisis. And we can solve it hugely. We can just start growing pulses again, bring back integrated farming, and you'll have enough pulses, good soils, all of you who are here are part of that movement of reintegrating the nitrogen-fixing pulse crops into our agriculture. Instead, the government started to use the scarcity created by bad policy to start importing fake dals. I call them fake dals because we've never eaten something called a yellow pea. It's not in our list of dals. Who's growing it? Canada, becoming millionaires in the process. In 2011, we imported 2.2 million at $2.5 billion import bill. The controller, Auditor General, and I'm on the board of the CAG office, did an audit report and found 1,200 rupees, uh, 1,200 crores of a scam in the Dal imports. 1,200 crores. This year, the imports are 5.5. And the CAG said, this yellow pea, no one's eating it. It's rotting in your go-downs. Why are you importing it? But we are importing more. Because as our intelligence report, our income tax report, CAG itself has shown, there's a huge scam, huge kickbacks behind it. Now, this yellow pea has 7% protein compared to our, th our dals, which have 20 to 30% protein. So we've done a calculation for our new book. With 5 million tons of imports of yellow pea from Canada, not only have we blown up 4.5 billion dollars, we, and then the corruption behind it, we are losing 1 million tons of nutritious protein every year for the Indian diet. We are becoming degraded in our diet. And our soils are losing 1.1 billion kilograms of nitrogen that could have been fixed if we grew our own pulses. Or take the other uh, crop that was driven out of green through green revolution monocultures, our oil seeds. And every part of India has different oil seeds. The Deccan grows different oil seeds. In the north, we love our mustard. Kerala, the land of coconut, loves its coconut. And of course, Goa also loves its coconut, and tomorrow in Goa, they're going to have a huge campaign uh, to hug and do chipko of the coconut tree because the government wants to declare it as not a tree so that it can be cut down for real estate development. Uh, in 30 years, we are importing 70% of our edible oils. Our edible oils are the pure oils, like sesame like groundnut, like mustard. These are true oils mentioned in the Charak Samhita 5,000 years ago for their value as foods of healing. What are we importing? GMO soya and, GM and palm oil, for which entire rainforests are being chopped. By the year 2030, Indonesian rainforests will go for palm oil. And I don't think, as Indians, we want to be part of that destruction of nature. Soya oil, GM soya, has chopped down the Amazon and the Cerrados in the Americas. And it hasn't just got imported. Indians didn't get up one day and said, we want palm oil. We want to chuck our sesame. We want to eat palm oil. And we're going to eat GMO soya. And we definitely aren't today saying we want GMO mustard. While we are meeting here exactly now, there's a meeting taking place in um, the Environment Ministry. 
where they're trying to rush through a GMO mustard. This mustard was first introduced by Bayer. It was rejected on grounds of safety. It's been brought in through a person called Dr. Pentel, but his technologies are all the Bayer technologies. And uh, the company, uh, the subsidiary of Bayer, uh, which owns literally all the technology of transformation, is pro-agro. They're violating Supreme Court orders. 100 scientists have written. 10 states have said, do not approve. Of course, all farmers unions have said, do not approve. The data is being kept secret, even though the Supreme Court ordered that all biosafety data must be made public. So while I'm with you, everyone else in the Sarsan Satyagre is uh, protesting at the ministry. And for those of you who like to tweet, or whatever you do, Facebook, etc., do send a message to the environment minister and the prime minister now to say India is waking up, we will not eat bad toxic food, and our farmers will not grow crops like the BT cotton that got them into debt and pushed them to suicide. I've done studies on the BT cotton from the time the first suicide took place in Telangana. I remember rushing back, it was my first visit to Telangana. It was a young boy who'd been hybrid cotton at that time. And he got into debt. And with the BT cotton, the situation got worse. Monsanto is suing the government of India. It sued the government of Andhra Pradesh when these go when our governments tried to regulate the price because the price of seed jumped 80,000% for the royalty collection of Monsanto. Andhra has written a letter, but Monsanto doesn't have a patent. So there's no question of re revoking a pass patent. The issue is stop the royalty collection. It is theft, it is a crime, and compensate. You can't compensate a lost life, but they is a huge amount Monsanto owes. And we are building up a tribunal on Monsanto on the 16th of October, international tribunal for Monsanto's crimes against nature and against humanity. And I, you know, we'll keep in touch, Vital, we'll keep in touch so that we can build up the evidence. I'm having a planning meeting soon, and we'll know the scope of how, how far we can go but I'll be in touch with you so we can take this further. So I was in Sevagram three days ago because the same companies that are pushing the GMO soya on us are also writing food safety laws. Cargill is sponsoring rallies for food safety. And Gandhi's Ghani has been shut down under these laws. So I was there for a Satyagraha for Gandhi's Ghani and one of my dreams is that as we move in the permaculture movement, in creating permanent economies, we have ghanis everywhere. Because ghanis are the cold press, virgin cold press mills. If there's a virgin cold press mill, the farmer will grow oil seed. When there's good oil seed extracted on a virgin cold press mill, people in cities will buy it. As Harvard had written, Health is one grand continuum, from the soil to the plant to humans. When we take care of the soil, we create health for ourselves. And I think the two products around which the bad system, the degraded system, the dishonest system, the toxic system, and the regenerative system, the honest system, the fair system, which takes care of the earth and takes care of people, the two crops in which this contest is going to come head on this year are pulses and oil seeds. So one of the things we've started, besides the fact that in Navdanya we have the seed banks, which is the first step of regeneration, the ecological agriculture, and the fair trade control by farmers, where farmers shape the market, not through middlemen, but through direct links with consumers. We are calling this the food smart citizen. You can build good concrete high rises 
That doesn't make living smarter. If you're dying of diabetes or a heart attack, the price of your apartment isn't going to decide how well you're living. And so you're so many of you in Hyderabad, you have such a strong community that put together this amazing convergence. Make that convergence a convergence of linking farmers directly to those who care in the city. Begin with 100. Begin with 100 volunteers you have here. And already, another economy will start taking shape. We have to build living economies now, just and fair economies, because the dominant economy is so deceitful. I'm just doing a critique of our Niti Aayog's paper on raising agricultural productivity and making farming remunerative for farmers. And every recipe given is the disease that caused the crisis. GMO, BT cotton caused a crisis for farmers. They're saying more GMOs. Fertilizers have caused a crisis for the soil. They're saying more fertilizer. The liberalization of imports have created the dependence on import of pulses and oil seeds. They're saying more import dependence. The food scarcity comes out of the fact that in 91, the trade liberalization policies and structural adjustment said Indians should no, not grow food anymore. They should grow flowers and fruits and meat for export and, and shrimp. Nellore, I remember coming to Nellore for the shrimp. Well, we've seen what is done to our food systems, but our floriculture exports have collapsed. And here, I remember in Medak was this al kabir that was set up for exports. None of this is working, and a failed experiment is being recommended to destroy agriculture further. So not only do we need the permanent recovery of nature's ecosystems and social ecosystems, we need the politics of permanence. For me, the democracy is a politics of permanence, because in democracy you can correct unstable tendencies. Permanence means you have homeostasis. You can come back from an unstable thing to a stable level. And the capacity lies in the system itself, in the plant, in the soil, in the human being, in the farmer, in the village community. It is also called resilience. It is also called adaptation. This resilience, this adaptation, is what we need to build. But the most important thing is, I think we have wonderful, visions from amazing visionaries, like Bill Mollison, like Alfred Howard, all the people who've given years, we were just counting 35 years of friendship between those of us who have uh, rejuvenated the ecological agriculture movement in this country. So at, on the one side, you have brute laws, dishonest governance, uh, secrecy in decision making, violation of every constitutional obligation, and on the other side, you have an upholding of this amazing civilization of permanence, celebration of its diversity, and a commitment that we will not let our soils, our biodiversity, our water be ruined. We will not allow our farmers to be pushed to suicides. We will not allow our children to live lives of a diseased future. The future is in our hands, and that future we will shape on the terms of living earth, living communities, living democracy. Thank you.